Welcome to our Saturday simulcast, April 13th edition. Uh, we're going to put a wrap, at least a, a temporary wrap on Batman's basketball. Uh, it seems to be an ongoing situation just because uh, the season never stops. And recruiting and all the other things that Brian will be doing over the summer here will be going at it as well. But uh, Tom and, or Tom, that'd be Mike. Mike and Brian both returned home safely, as did the I. This respect from, is just <laughs> staggering. <laughs> well, <laughs> got back. To yeah, Phoenix this, disrespectful to Tom. No, no. <laughs> okay, I'm, Tom I'll be your Tom. <laughs> Tom will be here next week, and we'll talk about spring spring football. But all right, guys, you, you, obviously the Purdue uh, finishing the national runner-up uh, to uh, the team that beat them, and of course that being UConn on Monday night. But, Brian, I just wanted to, you know, you've written a little bit uh, on the back end here about kind of what all this means. But to, now that you have four or five days separation from the event of uh, Monday night, uh, you're what starts to be your takeaways uh, with what this team accomplished uh, in 23-24? Yeah, just that it was a pretty remarkable season for Purdue and the outcome of the title game, I don't think changes that. For them to get back to where they were a year ago and get over the hump and get to the strata they got to was pretty was pretty hard. And, uh, you know, I, I think the thing that sort of defined this team all year long was the fact that they never really phoned one in. I mean, you look at that UConn team that was an absolute machine. They lost games, and they shouldn't have lost games. That team yeah. is unbelievable. Purdue really brought it every night all year long, and for them to have come into the season with the burden they carried from last season, whether that be fair or not, and actually get better and actually replicate their success from the year before uh, and never really show any effects of the pressure on them, you know, sort of things like that never really show any of the inconsistency that I think every college basketball team is sort of entitled to was really remarkable. And uh, just an outstanding season by Purdue. Zach Eady somehow got better. I think you saw, uh, you know, Braden Smith take a jump from really good player to great player. I think you saw Purdue shooting normalize. Um, I think Lance Jones was transformative. And I think Purdue just... Just had a great year and really, really uh, delivered above and beyond what everybody could have reasonably expected of them. You know, Carm, you, this is, we were talking offline, your fourth Final Four. And this I, was Brian, this is your second, right? Because you did women in 2000. Are we counting women? Yes, we're counting women. Of course we are. Yeah. It, right? it, it, it's my second Final Four. Yeah. yeah. So, my, and, and, I, and just talking about team dynamics, and you watched, you know, from a win, and you watch the men obviously all these years, but the women, uh, what it to be a champion, and of course, UConn uh, had enough to, to take for Purdue. But just looking at it from that that realm, where this team, you know, continued to get, like Brian said, continued to not, not mail it in. But now, having looked back at the UConn game, UConn was really good. Did, was there was there an opportunity down the road? I mean, if had Purdue played UConn ten times, is this a team that Purdue could beat? two or three times, or is this a team that UConn would just be difficult to beat in your perspective in any situation for Purdue? Well, Who are you talking have to? A... <laughs> What's that? Who are you yeah. talking to? I'm talking to Mike. You can both okay. answer the question, but Mike, you're first. Uh, well, I mean, if you're going to play a 10-game series, Purdue's going to win some games in that series. It's just, right. it's just it's going to happen because UConn's not going to be on every night and Purdue's not going to be off every night. Um, I mean, what, what, in my mind, what UConn did to Purdue is what other teams have tried to do Purdue, but they couldn't execute it at the level UConn right. did. And mm -hmm. they didn't maybe have the personnel to do it the way that uh, UConn did it. And, you know, Purdue has needed three pointers all year. They only attempt seven. If, if they actually did attempt seven, that, that mattered in the game. And you only hit one. And once you got behind by nine, Going by two to catch up wasn't wasn't a feasible option for them, so they needed to to get some more three point shots. But they took what the defense gave them, and and you know, and as Brian said, and it's correct, it's a great year. I, I don't view Purdue as a national championship or bus program. Right. It's, it's I mean they they exercise a lot of demons this year. They got over the hump in a lot of lot of situations, most notably getting to the Final Four. 
and it took a lot for them to get there. They had to wear the badge of that loss to FDU all year, and they handled it uh, remarkably well. They were open about it. Uh, they didn't run from it. You know, as Painter said, they had to sit in it, and, you know, they did. But, you know, that, that speaks to the, the character of the, the people they have on the team, the coaching staff, to be able not, – not to run from something that you know that you, you failed at. And, yeah. and I, you know, I do think it made them stronger. It made them better, made them work harder. But now, you know, if, if the goal is to win the national championship, then they have to approach this off season, like they lost to a 16 seed and come with the same level of intensity in the, but it's going to be a different team. It's just, it is going to be a different team. You don't have Zach anymore. You, you've got new faces, you've got new pieces. Purdue's going to play differently next year, but, um, a great year. I mean, they just, I mean, UConn is the best team in the country right now. And I, you can safely say Purdue is the second best team in the country. If there was anybody else but UConn on the other side, Purdue probably wins that game. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm, I'm safe in saying that and confident in saying that, that Purdue, you know, no one wants to be number two, but Purdue's place this year was right behind UConn. Yeah, a high number two and certainly a, uh, like you said, they talked about on to the end of time about it really being, and I think Brian, you wrote this too as well as this true national championship game, one versus two, and uh, we had the two best teams, with maybe the exception of Houston, but Houston uh, didn't get lucky at the right time and had, and didn't make it that far. You know, Brian, I think too that you look at uh, just the growth of this program and, and being able to sit in, and, and, and as you both mentioned, you know, first part I went back and watched the broadcast. It's the first part of the uh, of the TBS or TNT broadcast is going back to the FDU game. I mean, Purdue literally, from a national perspective, it was a it was a story of redemption, uh, and they redeemed themselves all the way to the very end. But uh, uh, that and Brian, you were around them all year. It's just not an easy thing to execute uh, from a mental standpoint. But it may speak to Purdue's toughness from. How, how it was able to develop that or how, how, how they were able to sit in and thrive throughout the course of the year. Yeah, I think it kind of, and I, I, I wasn't, you know, embedded with them all year long by any means, but like, sure. I think that what the FDU loss did was it sort of gave them a great team coming back this year that could view itself as an underdog. Yeah. And, had all kinds of slights out there that that they could drive off, and they had personality types that would respond to that sort of thing well. I, I've always kind of felt like Purdue's program has been generally an underdog, has been an overachieving sort of program. I don't know if that's necessarily true moving forward because Purdue's going to have pretty good teams kind of moving forward, so I don't know if the whole underdog thing is going to play long term, but I, I think historically Purdue has kind of been that way. And I think you had this this unique situation here where you have this team of Braden Smiths and Zach Edies who take things really personally, right? Yeah. And the FDU loss gave them um, the ability to both be the favorite on paper, but also the ability to credibly view themselves and carry themselves as the underdogs. And I think that sort of really mattered. And I think, you know, when Purdue won the Maui Invitational, I think it, <laughs> really kind of kind of threw down a gauntlet that said hey we are we are something special this year and uh you better watch out when you play us uh that kind of thing and I, I I think that's the important part of this that from a cultural perspective Purdue carry from this season on out is you might be the favorite but you can't carry yourself like a favorite because that's how you get complacent and that's how you you lose games and things like that that you shouldn't lose. And, uh, you know, Purdue's losses this year were all turnovers. They were just turnovers. They weren't. Purdue just never not showing up. Um, and I, I think that was what was really unique about this team's personality was that they were they were a double-digit favorite almost every night, and they carried themselves like they were a double-digit underdog. Yeah, uh, hard thing to do is a, from a team dynamic, but uh... – Certainly accomplished by Matt Painter's crew. All right, Mike, we, I did want to ask both of you guys, it's your first men's Final Four that you've covered, but uh, what that experience was like and being in, in the, I don't know if it was a fishbowl, but it was just, you know, it seems so strange even from my perspective 
just all, you know, it goes with the territory, but you're in the final game and there's, that's all they're talking about is Purdue everywhere and UConn, obviously it's everywhere you turn from a national perspective. But what was that like from you? What, what'd you, what'd you think about the experience, how it was handled, um, your access, all those kinds of things. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Mike and Brian, you can follow back up. Well, everything's pretty regimented from a schedule standpoint, at least from the media, uh, how they deal with us. So, you know, everything usually runs on time because that's the way the NCAA wants it. And you've got, at least when you get there, you got four teams that you got to walk through the whole process. And they've got a lot of obligations with their television partners and media partners that they have yeah. to adhere to. And then press conferences. And I mean, there's plenty of access. There really is. You have an open locker room and then you have breakout rooms. And, um, you know, from the other final fours that I've covered, really, it's not much different. Uh, now there's more people at this one. Um, so that, that was a little different. I, I just, um, all I can say is I don't think you can cover these things by yourself. You need, <laughs> you, you, cause there's just too many access opportunities that go on at the same time. Open locker room, breakout rooms, press conference. I mean, they all kind of, they all kind of go at the same time. So you can't, if you're a one man operation or one person operation, it's very hard to, to get around to all that stuff. But, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to cover one of these things. If you've never done it before. Um, and you don't, you know, if you've been through it, you're not as overwhelmed uh, as you are if you haven't been through it. So it's just, you know, just keeping up with things, knowing, you know, you're on West coast time. That throws a, yeah. a wrinkle into it, but the good news is there's no really hard deadlines anymore in the world. Yeah. You, just, you write your stories or do your business, and then you post it, and that's your deadline. But no, it's, it's a great experience, I, and I'll take this moment to thank both of you for allowing me to tag along. And We're thanking uh, you for being a key <laughs> contributor, so we're going uh, Not only for the uh, Final Four, but throughout the NCAA tournament, throughout the whole year, so... I appreciate uh, both of you allowing me to be a third wheel uh, this season again. We'll have to see if I use my COVID year uh, next year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it's a great experience. It's one of those highlights that, you know, as you as people wrap up their careers, it's, you know, it's one of those special things that, that you'll remember, especially this one because uh, of the time between Purdue Final Fours. I mean, 44 years yeah. uh, to, to do that. Um, you know, something to, to, to be proud of. And, but, you know, it, it just, it was a great, great journey and a great opportunity to, to experience that once again. I, I thought maybe there might be more media people there than what there were. Uh, and that's probably just the state of the business more than anything else. And, you know, probably 20 years ago, it probably been crawling with, you know, two or three times more people. But I think the business has, whittled off the crowd a little bit yeah it's uh carmen is not in the transfer portal yet <laughs> you know not 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 officially so that's a that's a good thing brian you're 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 you know you've obviously covered a lot of big events and this is a big one how what was your take on i it's always interesting i want to ask both of you is the, the interesting thing about open locker room which the ncaa tournament seems to do and then you don't seem to get a lot of that any other place post game or Am I mistaken there? But uh, Brian, would you give me your give me your take on what the experience was like for you. Yeah, uh, removing all all emotional investment. This was a dream come true professionally. I've yeah. always wanted to do this. It was unbelievable. It was tiring. It was really tiring. Yes. Uh, the sensory overload part of it is just you walk in that you walk into the uh, stadium and it's just, everything's so big, everything's so bright, everything's so loud. I've been to, you know, obviously major sporting events uh, a lot in, over a very long period of time. I have partial hearing loss in one of my ears because of Mackey Arena. Yeah. So I, I am. Workman's cop. I, I am kind of desensitized to a lot of this stuff, but very little impresses me anymore about my job. Um, but this was pretty awesome. And this is something I'll never forget, something I always wanted to do. Um. I will echo Mike. You can't do this by yourself. And I owe him a huge thank you because I would have been overwhelmed uh, by trying to do this by myself. Uh, there was one day um, I just had to go back to my hotel room and sleep when I should have been writing. 
Um, he saved my ass. I mean, he literally, pardon my French, but he 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 saved my. Internet. You know what? It's the internet. All right. <laughs> you just set a precedent. Here come the F1. Um, no, uh, I, you can't do it by yourself. There's just there's just too much going on at the same time. You have to choose between press conferences and open locker rooms, and you cannot go to a press conference when you have access to an open locker room. It's just yeah. not. It's just a. It's just bad business to sacrifice free reign over everyone in the locker room versus getting two questions to a coach. Maybe when you're uh, when the room is full of national people and YouTube guys and content guys and things like that. And um, it is a lot. It, it is an awful lot. Um, but in order to cover things to the extent we want to cover things, obviously I can't speak to everybody. If you're a newspaper guy writing one story a day, you might not have all that, all that much trouble. They provide you with so much material. But if you want to cover something to the extent we cover something, you have to have multiple people there. It's just... It's just so much, um, but it, it was awesome. I mean, it was the experience of a lifetime from a professional perspective. Uh, expensive, obviously. <laughs> That's not my problem. It's only money. I keep saying that. It's only That's money. That's your problem, buddy. But uh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, no, it it's uh, the, the the traffic in Phoenix is is something uh, we can. <laughs> I think, uh, I think a lot of our viewers probably experienced that themselves. My Uber took twice as long as it was supposed to to get me from Glendale to Phoenix. When they say this event is in Phoenix, that is not accurate. Glendale is not Phoenix. No, nope, um, sure isn't. Glendale is to Phoenix what Carmel probably is to Indianapolis, mm -hmm. uh, if not uh, West Lafayette to Indianapolis, something like that. <laughs> um Phoenix is clearly a city that is outgrowing its infrastructure, so the traffic is is not pleasant. Uh, I'm sure parking was expensive uh, around the stadium. I'm sure food got more expensive on the event days. I, I've been joking about ripping on the <laughs> Carl's Jr. by uh, they're not a sponsor, so have at it. Go by ahead. the stadium for upping all its prices fifty percent on the day of of events. Uh, not that I ate there, but. Um, it's funny. No, it, it was uh, it, it was pretty awesome, and um, yeah. I'd love to go back sometime professionally. It has no, nothing to do with Purdue; just has to do with the fact that I've always wanted to cover one of these things, and now I want to cover another one. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. You know, even from uh, somebody that was sitting in the stands the last two weeks, of which I was, uh, you know, and I was I was I wasn't worried about you guys. But I said I just felt tired anyway. And it's, I think it's the function, like Brian, like you said, it is, it's sensory overload. Yes, there's a level of, you know, these games are so, every possession seems to count. Uh, there's so much weighing on them. And from that standpoint, it was, it was a great event. And yet it was, uh, it is draining. And again, I wasn't working like you guys were at the same level, to say the least. And it, it uh, very much uh, the case. Though so I thought for the most part, uh, outside of the $62 parking, which I understand that's the way of the world these days. But uh, uh, from a from a from a fan perspective, or getting in and out, it was pretty good uh, for, from for the gang that I was with, and we certainly had a a, a great time. And and, and it, gosh, there was a blue the term blue million, but a Purdue people. I don't know how many P Purdue fans that came in from didn't have tickets for Saturday, but came in on Monday. It seemed to me, and I don't know from where you were. You know, it's almost two thirds of the crowd was was Purdue, and, and it was really, really impressive from that standpoint. This and was a great it, showcase yeah. for what kind of Purdue basketball is all about. Yes, I and I, I, I think that was a really important thing for the program that people could hear Purdue fans on TV. Oh yeah, no people question. could see it, and I think people now have been exposed to how basketball crazy a place Purdue is. And I don't know if that was general knowledge before and. If you went to any of the team stores uh, or any of the souvenir stands before the game, it was, as I think I wrote somewhere before the game, if you've ever wondered what it looks like when you drop a hot dog in a piranha tank, <laughs> that's what Purdue fans were doing to those team stores and those souvenir uh, stands. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, Carmen, you were going to say something? or you? you no, there's, so, there's something along the line. I mean, we we since we're around it all the time and been around it for a long time, we, we kind of understand the passion that, 
that, that Purdue fans, not only for basketball, but for all their sports if, when they reach this level. Uh, but I think the nation got a glimpse of a underappreciated fan base from the outside. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody that comes to Mackey Arena or follows Purdue on a regular basis understands the, the, the kind of fans they have and the number of fans that they have across the country. But I think, as Brian alluded to, the nation got a glimpse of what, uh, what these fans mean to the, the basketball program and what the basketball program means to the fans. And if anything, it, it has opened that door to the nation to, to show, to show that. And, you know, the, I, I equate the crowd Monday night to similar to what it was at the Rose Bowl back in 2001. Mm-hmm. I mean, Purdue, Purdue dominated that stadium in Pasadena that day and they dominated the stadium. Again, I think the money that Purdue fans funneled into Glendale, Phoenix, Arizona probably would support several third world countries yeah, uh, no doubt. <laughs> over the next five years because they were willing to pay any ticket price. They were willing to pay any hotel price. They were willing to, to spend whatever they needed to spend uh, on an airline or transportation to get there and be a part of it. And I think that's mm-hmm. a they, they wanted to be a part of it because it, it had been so long. Uh, not. But I think if this happened two years from now and three years from now, I think you'd you'd have the same impact from the Purdue fans. I don't think it would change. I think it would still, uh, if you were in the same situation, the same stadium and all that, I think they would have two-thirds of the building uh, again. And I think just those that weekend, I think, opened everyone's eyes outside of Purdue and Indiana to what kind of fan base really resides uh, not only in West Lafayette, Lafayette, but across the country. I mean, you had, I, I, I can only picture every state was represented by a Purdue fan in that building. I mean, I don't, I don't see how you couldn't do it. They're just not all Indiana people. They're, they're California, they're Arizona, yeah. they're Nevada, whatever, Texas. I mean, they all, they all came from far away to, to be a part of this. And, uh, hopefully, uh, that's a takeaway that people outside Purdue, um, realize and, and and appreciate it and now it's i think it, it should get a little bit more respect from a, from the outsiders i have a theory I, I on this it, yeah i have a theory on this i go think ahead. that um you know i go to these mtes every year whether it's connecticut whether it's south carolina whether it's hawaii whether it's cancun uh wherever it might be that Purdue plays in november san purdue diego pe- next year san diego yeah. next year purdue people turn out like crazy yeah. And I think it's because Purdue might not have a national fan base per se, but I think they have a fan base that's spread nationally. I think when you're an engineering science school, um, not engineering science, engineering and science, yeah. things like that, your alums tend to spread out. They go internationally, they go to the coasts, they go to the big cities. Whereas if you're a liberal arts law even med school type of school like Indiana, your people graduate and set up shop locally. They set up their 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 uh, law firms, their medical practices, whatever it might be, locally. So when Purdue goes somewhere outside of Indiana, you have all these people spread around the country with money who want to travel. They don't get to see Purdue play very often. You have a great local fan base, obviously, which is the reason Macarena is packed to the gills every game. But you also have these people all over the country who view these distant uh, sort of high-profile events as their one chance a year to combine a vacation to basketball. I I see it every year. Atlantis was another great example. There were tons of Purdue people down there. Um, I think that's kind of the unique part of Purdue's fan base is that you might have an event in Indianapolis that you don't necessarily pack the place but when you go to Honolulu or Maui, you do pack the place. And I I, I think that's, um, as I said before, it's not necessarily a national subway alumni network as much as it is just an alumni network that's kind of spread nationally. And uh, I think when Purdue finally got to a Final Four, and I think Purdue has had, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I monitor a message board. <laughs> um, and I... I can tell you for better and worse, Purdue fans have been waiting for this 
some patiently, some not so much, more than any fan base probably in America. And when this finally happened, this was going to be insane. And that's exactly what happened. And when you saw what I saw and what Carm saw uh, on the floor in Detroit after they beat Tennessee, people just in tears, former players, you know, hugging one another and just the weight that was lifted, the catharsis that was experienced by the whole Purdue basketball family, its whole, its whole following was just unlike anything I've probably seen in college sports. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, too, even from be, sitting in the stands, is you're exactly right. There were a lot of people that aren't in Mackey Arena all the time but do come come to an event because they can and so if they want to shell the money out, secondary ticket market, it's there. Uh, they were available, and they were the, the market was better on Monday night, at least because you, know, you had two teams that were no longer there. There was probably a little bit more availability. But it, it was amazing how many different people I saw that I hadn't seen in years that weren't people that came to Mackey Arena, just in the hallways. And, yes, there were people that said to me, uh, you know, I think I spent as much money on this trip as I would have going on a cruise. But uh, I get it. Uh, it was that way. And that was uh, – and it's amazing to me that you can mobilize as fast as some of these teams. Look at North Carolina State. had no idea they were going to – you know, we – we all sensed that Purdue had a good chance to get to the Final Four throughout this tournament. NC State not as not as much, and they still get a lot of folks coming. But uh, yeah, it was it was. If you're a Purdue person, uh, it was pretty much Nirvana. And even the importance too of winning on Saturday, and outside the obvious, just having the extra two days of glow going into such a big build up national championship game, hard to beat. Um, from a Purdue perspective, uh, certainly, and, and may, may not be duplicated, but uh, if you're a Purdue fan, you hope it will be sooner than later. Which brings me to my next question, and Brian, I'll, go, I'll start with you on this one. Just looking ahead now, you start to look down, uh, obviously, Zach Eady, Mason Gillis, Ethan Morton, Lance Jones will no longer be with this program, uh, and yet uh, this program is going to move forward with six new new uh, kids coming, new student-athletes coming in, to use an NCAA term. Uh, what's your early feelings towards next year? This is not the, the cupboard is far from bare. It's going to be a very different team next year, but uh, there's going to be some interesting guys to watch, to say the least. Yeah, I think Purdue's all set up. I think they're. Uh, I think this season served as notice that what Matt Painter's doing uh, amidst very changing landscapes works. And I, I think at some point you're going to end up with a young team playing against adults, and that's going to be a competitive disadvantage uh, when everybody else is, you know, going out and building mercenary teams full of transfer portal guys. Uh, that'll ease up a little bit when the COVID year finally goes away. But um, I think Purdue's got guys now, uh, Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, Trey Kaufman Wren, that make for a really nice core. Camden Heidi, Miles Colvin, provided they make pretty considerable jumps next season, which they should. I think you've got a really nice core kind of coming back. And uh, I think you're all set up for the future uh, here to be consistently really good. And, you know, every now and then, every few years, having that team that is capable of doing something. But um, I think that it's uh, um, something where Purdue needs to uh, – make sure its leaders are taking the lessons from this season and passing them down to the people who come after them. That's kind of where things went sideways on Purdue back in the early 2010s when they just hit this leadership wall with uh, some lackluster groups that came in after Robbie Hummel, Lewis Jackson, uh, Ryan Smith, and those guys, and that's where Purdue needs the Braden Smiths and the lawyers and the Camden Heides and the Trey Kaufman Rands to really be great leaders kind of moving forward too because you sort of captured something this season that you need to hold on to at all costs and make sure that it's getting passed down from class to class here. Uh, I, I, I think Purdue has a pretty good group in terms of doing that, uh, but I, I think it's absolutely essential that the, that this season end up being the moment the bar was raised and the, the standard for all these guys now is, you know, I'm not saying it was just winning the Big Ten before, but winning the Big Ten. And then now that you've got to a Final Four, doing it, you know, every couple of years, maybe. I, that's probably a lot to ask, but uh, just don't make this your last trip to the Final Four. I'm 
fairly certain that's probably not going to be the case under Matt Painter, but um, that needs to be the standard for Purdue now to be able to replicate this sort of thing. You know, Mike, Braden Smith and, and Brian mentioned Fletcher Lawyer seem to me uh, uh, watching them a little bit from afar, but watching them is that uh, guys that aren't satisfied, certainly Braden is one that takes losing, seems to also uh, personally and, and losing meaning losing the national championship game to UConn. But uh, the, the right mock, the right balance, you've been around a lot of teams in your professional career, seems to me the ingredients are there to keep that leadership quotient moving forward even with the six new players coming in they've got guys that now have been to the high, been to the highest place and know what it feels like and and I have a, that sense that they want more what's your, what's your sense just being around those guys oh yeah they want a, they want a national championship I don't think there's any question about that and just like um this year's team had to you know, you brought in Lance Jones, you brought in Miles Colvin. You know, they had to absorb the hurt that they experienced uh, against FDU to to get them in a, in, a, in a place to help push this team forward, and they did. Now you're bringing in six new people with a, with a core group that has been to the Final Four, been to the national championship game, and they've got to relay that to, to the, new, the newcomers, how, how important that is. And, you know, Brian mentioned it, you know, Matt Painter mentioned it after the game about, you know, this is the standard now. And that's kind of, I think, the message that will will resonate going forward. It's like, well, this is this is where this program needs to be every year. Will it get there every year? Probably not, because it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, back when UCLA did it, it did. But it, uh, yeah. UCLA is done for now. Uh, so I, th- you know, I think Braden and and Fletcher and Trey Kaufman and Ren and, and even the younger guys coming back with Cam Heidi and even Miles Colvin. And it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be a strong message to the incoming uh, freshmen uh, and to those that are going to get more playing time out of this too. Even if you're on the team this year, so there's, you know, I I think they're they are set up to to continue what they've done. Um, you know. It, You've got the – haven't been to the Final Four yet off off the back. Now you've got to, you know, get back there again. You can't – you know, you don't want this to be a one-and-done situation where it's another 20 years or 25 years before you do it again. But, you know, the way that Matt's recruiting and the way the program is set up, I'd be shocked if it you – know, I'll, I'll be shocked if they're not back there within the next five years. Yeah. Uh, and just because of the way they do things, uh, and in five years from now, who knows what a final four will be based yeah. on what <laughs> we have no idea what tournament's going to be played. That is correct. Uh, it, the it, final it, 16 it, might be the equivalent <laughs> yeah. of the final four. That's right. We let those so, NCAA people do what they want to do with TV. Right. Yeah. Whatever the, whatever the promised land is, I think Purdue will get there again based on the current situation but there's just so many uh things that are going to happen and we all know that they're going to happen over the next you know could be five years it could be a decade it could be shorter than that you know whenever you know the big 10 and the SEC want to just flex their muscle and take off to 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 planet pluto (laughs) and 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 do it all by themselves uh but you know purdue's going to get back there they just i mean there's just too many good things that happen you know, I remember when they lost to Virginia in 19. It's like, okay, yeah, that that's a tough loss and one that, you know, you didn't you didn't know if they could overcome, but you also have the confidence that they were doing things the right way and eventually they would get there. Now it took took another five years to get there, if you you know, four if you discount COVID, but still. Yeah. You know, they got there and I think they'll make a return trip uh yeah. before long. Yeah, Matt Painter's the ultimate process guy, and and you think that that uh, the process seems to be very, very uh, uh, make a lot of sense in terms of what they're trying to get done. All right, Brian, it, 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 you know, we know Mason Gillis and Ethan Moore are in the transfer portal, not a surprise by anyone, and I know it's hard to wave a magic wand in terms of, of knowing, you know, you know that's the sixty four thousand dollar question with every program is who's staying, who's going. Any sense there? I mean, it seems to me there's a lot of stability there, and everything. Look at what you guys have talked about over the last ten minutes. Really speaks to that as well. Um, 
Do we expect that to action or, or should we just live in the world of expecting, uh, to use the Gene Cady term, expect the unexpected? Is that uh, uh, what we'll see here in the next uh, few, few weeks and if in the off season for Purdue? Yeah, this is the part of the show where I ignore your question and uh, just okay. talk about whatever I want, and then I'll <laughs> Thank come you, back Matt. to it. Thank you, Matt. Go ahead. Fire Matt away. Pay- Matt Payton um, press conference again. <laughs> um, just to go back to Carm's point about tournament expansion, like I, I think there's been some situational significance in what Purdue has done this season, winning the Big Ten again. I think this was – I think this was – Maybe the last really, really meaningful Big Ten title um, because of what the Big Ten's about to become. I think championships are always going to be meaningful no matter what your conference looks like. But this was the last one that you beat out Michigan State, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Ohio State for all your traditional rivals. Now you bring in this kind of Western Bureau of four schools that have nothing to do with Big Ten culture, who who knows how invested they are in winning Big Ten titles, full of kids who grew up in Long Beach or Portland or wherever who, you know, didn't grow up wanting to win Big Ten titles, wanting to play in, you know, in front of the people in states where Big Ten basketball is the biggest thing in their state. You know, that, that you look at Indiana, you look at Iowa, places like that. Kids grew up wanting to play at Iowa. Kids grew up wanting to play at Indiana or Purdue. And that stuff's not going to resonate with some of these Western teams coming in. It's just going to change the dynamic of the conference. And the scheduling is going to be so wonky now that that's inevitably going to warp the standings even more than what the Big Ten already has in its, in its unbalanced scheduling, uh, things like that. Um, Purdue getting to the final four now before TV messes this all up, like it inevitably will. As I always say, when it comes to TV inventory and college sports, more is undefeated. If TV ever decides, hey, you know what? We want another weekend of the NCAA tournament, which means 30 more teams get in. This thing's going to get watered down. It just is. And getting to the final four now before the final four becomes maybe a little bit less meaningful to, to, than it it's been for generations um now that that's probably the dystopian worldview of all this but um i think it matters um because you can only expand this thing so far without watering it down it's already the most randomized championship event in sports as far as i'm concerned um if you throw in 30 more teams like NC State. Had NC State played for the national title, it would have been an invalid national title because it would be the classic fluke of a team who just got hot at the right time. Their place there would not have... All due respect to NC State and what they did the last couple weeks, which was remarkable, but it would not have reflected the whole season. Now, if you're just going to put everybody in, uh, you water down the season, you water down the last four teams standing, it's just not the same. So for Purdue to get there now when it really, really means something before they're able to take away some of the meaning of those last teams standing, I, I think is significant. To your other question about the portal. You are going to answer it. Good. Fire away. Um, I was going to repeat it if you wouldn't. <laughs> Go ahead. We have known for months, I have known for months, I've communicated this to our readers on our site, that it's just business. Mason Gillis and Ethan Morton have their COVID years right now in college basketball, the NIL money that's going to be available to them at a lot of schools is still better than whatever, you know, they probably would have, they could have made in their first year in basketball, out of basketball after college on top of the fact, and let's not forget also, this is still an educational endeavor, even though both are going to have their, both are are going to have their degree. Both of those guys are good students. So yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Both are going to have degrees. This is an opportunity, should they so choose, to start other degrees. Mason Gillis can be all set up, man. He's going to have an undergrad from Purdue. He's going to have a graduate degree, I think, yes, from Purdue. And then he can start something else, should he so choose, somewhere else. And somewhere else could be pretty good. I mean, it could be it could be a, a really high-end academic school. And, uh, you know, you th- the same thing for Ethan Morton. I think those guys 
were the face of kind of what made Purdue work this year. They both were guys who started a lot of games for Purdue, really could have done a lot more for Purdue than they ended up doing. Mason Gillis could have been a 30-minute-a-game guy who started every game. Ethan Morton could have been a starter uh, for Purdue. Uh, they will get opportunities now to play expanded roles wherever they go um, after they did everything they that Purdue could have asked of them. The goal is to get a degree and play four years, and I think that's how Purdue has continued to to view the college experience throughout this COVID year phenomena, all of that stuff. And um, they played their four years. They won a lot of games at Purdue. They got their degrees. They did what they came to Purdue to do, and now good for them to go get something else somewhere else. And this doesn't change Purdue's scholarship situation. These scholarships have always been part of the calculus of Purdue being overbooked for next year. So people saying this opens up scholarship space, they're wrong. They just, right. they don't know what they're talking about. It, it's these scholarships have always been accounted for. Um, so I do think Purdue's a big believer in things run their course after four years, uh, stuff like that. You owe us four years and you owe us you getting your degree after that. Um, You've done your part. Uh, so people who are going to be conflicted about seeing Mason Gillis wearing a different uniform next year, I completely get it. People love Mason Gillis. People should love Mason Gillis. But this was always how this was going to end. This was always how how um, this was going to turn out. That it happens after Purdue got to the Final Four, got over the hump, won multiple Big Ten championships with these guys the last couple of years um, is almost kind of a perfect ending. Um but yes, they they will be playing somewhere else next year. Yeah, and good for them. They're both quality guys. As for the portal, Purdue's yes, Purdue's a non-participant. Uh, we'll yeah. see what happens here in terms of if anybody jumps in. I I, I don't anticipate it at this point. Um, but Purdue's a non-participant in the transfer portal this year. They're overbooked on scholarships. Uh, they're going to keep building with high school kids, continuity, player development so on and so forth. There will come years where this catches up with them, where they lose a guy, somebody transfers, somebody gets hurt, whatever it might be, and they have to go out and find a Lance Jones or a David Jenkins. Um, but they're not going to play the game that a lot of other people are playing on a regular basis. Again, it will catch up to them. It's an inevitability for everybody in college basketball nowadays, everybody in college sports nowadays. But they are not going to go out every spring and go get their best players out of the portal. Every couple of years, maybe every other year, maybe every year for all we know. It's going to catch up with them. They're going to have to add one guy, something like that. But right now their scholarships are packed to the gills, and there's really nothing they can do, even if they wanted to. So uh, that's the long and the short of it as far as Purdue and the transfer portal goes. Carm, you get last word here. Give us some brilliance here as we put this to an end. I have held you guys long enough. Well, I'm just happy Wisconsin coaches can now contact Mason Gillis <laughs> that was yeah. wild, man. I can't believe. Yeah, I tell that story. Not everybody's, not everybody's read that story, but go hey, hey, share with yeah. what you will, and then we'll go back no. to Carmen. Well, we're Brian standing on the floor yeah. before Purdue plays Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and Joe Krabenhoff, who's one of Wisconsin assistant coaches, goes up to Mason Gillis, stops him. Mason Gillis has to take his earbuds out of his ears to have a conversation with the guy, and Krabenhoff asks him if he's using his covid year next year the implication being we'd be interested in recruiting you if you were this is before the season is over this is before purdue and game. wisconsin play a game uh that was I, I good come, to be wanted come to find out later krabenhoff also talked to ethan morton on the floor this is shady as you know what i mean this is just unbelievable there are no boundaries uh in college basketball anymore uh, we all know tampering has been going on like crazy. Certain schools have spent their whole year messing with other people's players. I can name names. I'm not going to. But this was right in front of everyone. This was in front of an arena that's half full. This is around a kid's teammates. Like, there is no shame in college basketball anymore. This is what the landscape looks like. And it, it it's just incredible. Um but I, I it, now that Mason Gillis is in the portal, Joe Krabenhoff is free to contact him. <laughs> yeah. um, 
And now, the Gilses keep... have a history with Wisconsin. His sister went there initially for volleyball, right? So I don't know. Um, That's what that matters. But I think that uh, I, if I'm Mason Gillis, I don't know how to process that. I'm like, I'm preparing to play you. I'm wanting to beat your you-know-what right now. I'm not thinking about my COVID year. I'm not thinking about playing for the team I'm about to play against. You know, that, it would probably piss me off if I were him. Knowing him as a competitor um, probably didn't go over very well. It was kind of a one-sided conversation, if I recall correctly. I, it was a kind of a mumbled, I don't know yet, from Gillis. And uh, Krabenhoff just kind of went and did whatever Krabenhoff does before games after that. But it was bizarre. And uh, yeah. it was right there in front of everybody. There was no shame about it, no hiding it, no, no anything. And if the NCAA had any rules right now, or at least any enforceable rules, uh, you know, stuff like this might not be going on. But there are no rules. Uh, it is it is completely open season on everyone at all times. And um, when you see guys go in the portal and commit somewhere in two days, you know it, it's no secret what happened there. Um, yeah. The NIL piece of it now, in terms of using NIL directly to buy kids, uh, and I I know the term "buy kids" sounds salacious, but it is what it is. It, that is what's happening, and the. the that is the game Purdue is specifically not playing. Um, and that's kind of the backdrop to what has made the last couple of seasons for Purdue uh, even more meaningful, even more impressive, that they're not playing the game everyone else is playing. And there are competitive disadvantages that come with that. But Purdue has its way, and its way is working. And there's no real reason to believe that way won't stop working. All right, Carm, now you get your chance for the final order. We just take it. So go ahead. Sorry about that. I, I will ask, I mean, is that a situation where Matt Painter calls guard and says, hey, keep your keep your, keep your your assistance away from my guys, at least till after the season? You know, don't be, I don't don't know. be doing that on, on, our, on Purdue's home court on senior day. And, you know, this happens. I, I, I can imagine Matt calling and says, hey, just back okay. off for now. The only way I assume Painter would know is him watching this video. No, or I mean they reading they know what I it. wrote, or right. them seeing it, or Mason right. Gillis or Ethan Morton telling them. I don't know. I don't know if they know. I think but I think I, they know. I have no I idea. They, I think they knew that day Did because they? Mason would have potentially said something. Ethan would have potentially said something. I mean, you said something. I said something. So it's all yeah. It's all there. I. Uh, I I have no idea. I, I don't know if it's if it's worth the. I don't know. I don't know how Painter handles those sorts of things. I, like I don't know what you get out of it. Like, like what are they not going to do it next year? There's no more COVID year. <laughs> um, I have no. I have no idea. It, it is a really good question, but it's also a futile endeavor to try to to try to police these things anyway. So, um, Greg Gard might not even know. Well, I, I assume he knows by now. Well, yeah, he probably he's probably a loyal viewer of this show. He is. So. He's one of our forty-seven million that listen to us. If he doesn't know yet. He does he'll, now. He'll, he'll soon know now. Um, yeah, but w just wild times in college basketball, man. Wild times. The money being spent right now on people who are good to above average players is just astronomical. Um, it, it really highlights Lance Jones because Lance Jones, you know, I know this for a fact. This isn't me just spewing pro Purdue stuff here. Lance Jones didn't ask Purdue for anything. He just wanted to play at a higher level, wanted to enhance his ability to get some exposure, maybe get a pro contract in Europe or something like that, maybe get a G League sort of look after SIU. And he and Dalton connect are a couple of the real, real success stories of, you know, the transfer portal guys who just wanted an opportunity to higher level. I, I can't speak to what Dalton Connect uh, got from Tennessee, if anything, what he asked for from Tennessee, if anything. I have no idea. But these are guys who really helped themselves through this, through this COVID year portal mania. And, um, you know, Lance Jones, in some small way, made this all possible for Purdue this season. I mean, he really completed them. He really added an intangible element uh, personality-wise for Purdue, and just Purdue could not have done any better. 
uh, in terms of adding that one final piece uh, to this team than they did with Lance Jones. And yeah, maybe the there's a universe yeah. where Mason Gillis is that guy for Wisconsin next year. I have no idea, but that's kind of the goal now. Mason Gillis, Ethan Morton, go to a good team and make it great somehow. Um, those are the real success stories from this insanity that is the the portal era. Yeah, Lance Jones hit the shot that may have gotten Purdue over the hump, but Mike now. Yes, he did. Else you want to add to this? <laughs> Mike's eighth I'm... last word. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I really have it. Other than I don't think Mason Gillis is going to go anywhere and dance at halftime for the for the crowd no. like Lance Jones did. No, uh, but I will. I, I will say this about Lance. I think Lance brought a personality, and not that this team wasn't loose enough anyway, but it it enhanced their looseness. If that's a yeah, it's no a phrase doubt. I could a phrase I can use with them. Whether it helped them relax, it helped them manage stressful situations. I mean, his, his personality and, you know, and his backstory, uh, I mean, it says a lot that, you know, his father passes away just two or three months into his tenure at Purdue and the whole team shows up uh, to, to, to honor him and, and have his back and mm -hmm. uh, pay their respects. I, you know, it, it says a lot about this team. It says a lot about Lance, it says a lot about the culture that it, that is here. But as far as the season and what's next, I mean, again, this is this was a great year for Purdue. I know it fell short of what people wanted in the end, but you can't be disappointed about how this played out and what this team did to get to get to this point and the humps that they have they've overcome, the demons they had to get rid of to get to this point. And this was a, a program, again, a program achievement by Purdue. And I know that's it's probably that way at a lot of other places, but here at Purdue, it's a lot Different. Who's what was that? Who's what, how'd you get, how'd you was get that? the balloons to come up? I have no. I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, she had to. Have. Maybe it was. It couldn't have you been. You did that. Me. You have that sneaky God, look on it your was face. A celebration. You pressed, you, you no, pressed. I have no idea how I how that happened. I don't get it either. If there are any know, Zoom experts out there, please tell me how that happened. I was just sitting here. My hands were on my knees. I didn't do anything. <laughs> I don't think there's a better way to end our. It's not the end of our <laughs> no, no. basketball Saturday, We can talk Saturday all day, cast, but it does put. <laughs> if you guys want, we can talk all day because the people who are watching this just pump fifty billion dollars into Arizona's economy. <laughs> right. I think they'll watch fifteen more minutes. I want to yeah. know about the balloons. Yeah, I don't know I, either. Someone's gonna have your to help balloons. Us on that. Your balloons, Brian. I think they came right from you because they showed it right on your screen, and and how fitting a way. Did to somebody end say that. like a keyword or something? Did somebody you, say birth birthday? Would you go Safe back? Word keyword? I don't know. Birthday. Would you go back? When you go back and look at this and watch this, there's a suspicious look on your face when the balloons right before the balloons happen. My face so. is always suspicious. You know that. No, is, I, I you know, know that, that better but, than anyone. I swear but, to whatever higher power either of you subscribe to, I did nothing to trigger those balloons. I don't uh, believe it. I don't believe uh, it. I think you pushed it, the magic button. I think you did too. I think you did. I'm, we're going to stick. We're going to stick not, to that conspiracy theory. I'm not capable of doing that. I know I that. Just added a horn to my. All right, now you got a horn there. <laughs> yeah. See, all right, you, that's the that's the siren call that we're done here. But uh, you, gentlemen, thank you. We will have more of these throughout. I'm trying uh, to find uh, out how this happened. Of I want to know. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, yeah, I, I'm going to bet there money. Zoom I'll experts bet, here. I'll bet money somebody's going to be responding to this, and they'll and they'll give you plenty of insight. And, and do you remember uh, that video of the lawyer who who did the did the online discovery or whatever it was with the judge, and his daughter had had put on the cat filter. I, I remember seeing about that. Yeah, yeah. so it's that's me thing. right now. I have no idea what's <laughs> going on here. I'm just going to uh, hit he, buttons here, see if he, I can figure uh, this out. All right, he see if you can get anything else as we we will bring it to a close. Well, I thank the Union Club Hotel. And as Brian says, they will put one. Maybe they'll put one in San Diego next year when you go out there for Thanksgiving. But uh, uh, when Purdue heads out there, but we appreciate them as well. Appreciate Mike and and Brian. We appreciate Tom too. But Tom's not a part of this conversation yeah. today. So, but uh, we'll be hearing more from Tom uh, obviously on Saturday when uh, Purdue spring football, and we'll be talking to Tom next week. It's kind of a wrap to that so stay tuned we'll have regular regular saturday simulcast throughout the off season if there's such a thing and uh we look forward to that now brian raised his hand and this and the and the and the pictures moved at least on mine so do you have something you want to say no you just want to raise your hand i'm okay, trying to figure ahead. out these balloons uh this is awesome i don't know i got a mushroom I, I, 
Yeah. <laughs> yes, you got a mushroom there. Uh, we're gonna, we've opened up a whole can of mushrooms here, to, to say the least. All right, guys, thanks so much. Thank the Union Club Hotel. And, and a reminder that you can subscribe to goldenblack.com. You can also like us. You can become a subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can do a number of different things. Scissors. We'd love to have you a subscriber to goldenblack.com. He's got scissors on there now. Um, we appreciate you guys. Uh, many of you that I saw in uh, Phoenix at all were big, big Brian Newbert and Mike Carmen fans. Uh, why? Uh, I saw <laughs> lots of those guys. And why? Okay, there's no alcohol in this it's against the law. So have a great uh, rest of your weekend, all. Thanks so much. We'll continue this hijinks <clears throat> on our own time, so to speak. But thanks again for watching and listening. I don't know how I've been using Zoom so long. I never figured any of this out. <laughs>